Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for that song. Lord, there are so you. many. Thank you for that song. There are so many <laughs> echoes. <laughs> echoes. <laughs> echoes of our scripture. Echoes of our scripture. Echoes of our scripture. Prince of the power of the air tries to interfere and fluster us and throw us off, but you are faithful. We thank you for your faithfulness. And Lord, today as we open chapter 16 once again, I thank you that we get to go through it uh, more than once when we're here on Wednesdays, because every time we turn to your word, there's something new, something else you want us to hear. And so today, Lord, I pray that everyone here will leave this place knowing that in you, not in ourselves, but in you, we can have peace and we can have joy and we have the Holy Spirit when we put our faith in you. And Lord, we ask him, we ask you to send him here today to guide us into all truth. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, girls. Could we just give our uh, tech team a hand? <laughs> oh, my. You, you, I wish you could all know all the things that go on behind the scenes. And these girls are just calm, cool, and collective. And Lawrence comes and helps us, and God is good. Well, as we start today, I want to do a little review. I want to back you clear up to chapter 11. When Thomas, do you remember Thomas? I called him the Eeyore of the disciples. And he said, all right, let's go with him. Even if we die, let's go with him. And if you look at the cross-reference in Mark 10 for that situation, 1032 says, as they followed him, they were afraid. So this, this fear we're looking at even in today's chapter started way back there in uh, chapter 11. And then in chapter 13, Jesus and his disciples came into the upper room for the Passover, and Jesus started saying these things that were just completely disorienting to the disciples. He was going to be betrayed, what? And Peter was going to deny him, and then he's talking about going away. And then he said in chapter 14, verse 1, let not your hearts be troubled. And from that verse to the end of our passage today, everything that Jesus says was to allay the fear in the disciples. And allay isn't a strange word. It just means to calm a strong emotion, to set someone's fears at rest, or to relieve or reduce a painful emotion. And so that's what Jesus was doing for the disciples. And that's what he wants us also to gain from these passages, that they were experiencing these painful emotions of grief and fear that we see in our passage today. And that's what Jesus is addressing, that they don't have to fear. He's not going to leave them alone. He's going to send another helper, the Holy Spirit. And chapter 14, I hope you remember, says that all three persons of the Trinity are going to make their home in the disciples and in believers. So just that says there is no reason to fear. There's no reason to be afraid. But we all struggle with fear. For me, that's an ongoing uh, emotion that I have to put down through the Word of God and through the Holy Spirit. We all struggle with fear, don't we? Well, one of my favorite verses dealing with fear is Psalm 56, 11. In God, I put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? And it might be easy to memorize, but it's hard to do, right? And maybe it's not even easy to memorize. And my little grandsons are going to demonstrate okay, that for you. Listen to me. In God, I trust. I trust. 
trust. No, in God I trust. In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? What can the man do to me? It's not the man. It's what can man do to me. What can the man do to me? Not the man do to me. It's what can the... It's what can man do to me. What can the man do to me? It's not the man. It's can man. Uh, what can man do to me? What can the can man do to me? You guys are doing such a good job working on your Awana verses. What can a man do to me? That's right. What can a man do to you if you trust in what God? What can man do to me? That's right, Ray. I'm not doing <laughs> So you can see that's become a classic in our family and why we know this verse. <laughs> what can the can man do to me? Well, this entire section of scripture is Jesus telling the disciples that they do not need to fear the can man or any other man. <clears throat> and at the end of chapter 14, Jesus and the disciples left the upper room. They headed for the Mount of Olives. And as they went, Jesus gave them that beautiful illustration we looked at last week in chapter 15 of the vine and the branches. And why did he give them that? To comfort them, to console them and encourage them. He told them their love for each other and the Holy Spirit would encourage them to remain faithful and to testify of Jesus. They don't have to fear. And now today in chapter 16, we see Jesus review the spiritual resources that he has promised to the disciples. These three resources are the Holy Spirit, prayer, and peace. And these things will give them the courage they need to face what lies ahead. And I'm going to borrow from the end of our chapter, the last verse, Jesus says, I have said these things to you. The reason I'm telling you all of this is that so that in me, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. The tribulation is a given. You will have tribulation and trials. That's a given. The victory is already won. I have overcome the world. But the peace is an option. The peace is a choice. This is true, was true for them. It's true for us. The choice to take heart. And take heart, your version might say, be of good cheer. And the Greek word there is the same word we get catharsis from. It just means to have courage, have confidence, and be comforted. We have to choose to rest in the fact that Jesus has already overcome the world, and then we can be courageous for him, even in our trials. So friends, we want to choose to take heart, and that's how we're going to look at our chapter, take heart. We're going to look at the spirit of truth, and then from sorrow to joy, and then the secret of peace. So look with me at those first 15 verses. If you haven't got your Bible open, you might want to do that or hold your device. Our chapter opens with Jesus telling the, the disciples why he's giving them this specific teaching. So look at verse 1. The reason he's telling them these things is to keep them from falling. And if you take it in context from last week's chapter, it's to keep them abiding. Keep them abiding, keep them from falling. Your version might say stumbling in their faith. And isn't that the struggle in our trials? To stay faithful, to not give up, or to blame God and walk away. He's telling us these things to keep us from falling. And for the disciples, these threats are going to be very real. They will get kicked out of synagogues, like I said last week. You can read all about that in the book of Acts. And then in our passage, did you notice that Jesus did not say, 
if someone kills them. He said, when someone kills you, they'll think God, they're doing God a service. All the disciples but John were martyred. And John, he lived to be 90-some, but he is said to have been put in a pot of boiling oil, gave testimony to Christ and survived it. And then he was sent to be exiled on the island of Patmos. Jesus says in verse 4 that it's the things that he's telling the disciples right then and there, those things, these specific things, that he's telling them that is what is going to carry them through all of that, all of the per persecution and hardships. So friends, we need to look at our own lives and ask ourselves, are there things that are bringing us trouble, sorrow, and fear? I, I think the answer would be yes, right? And that's why the Lord has us studying these chapters. We need to camp in these chapters if we're experiencing sorrow and fear and trials. And so I'm going to put you back into chapters 14 and 15 again, and, and that's where Jesus first started telling the disciples that he was going to send them a helper, the Holy Spirit. And I don't think we can look at this too often. He is the paraclete. He comes alongside to assist, to give strength, and that term is that Greek term for a battle partner. That's such an important concept to remember about the Holy Spirit. A.W. Tozier gives us this timely reminder. We want to think that the world is our playground, but as believers in Jesus, it is a battleground. We are not here to frolic, but to fight. This is not our home. We are on a foreign battlefield. We're on a foreign battlefield. Now think about the disciples. The, they had been expecting to have a life of ease. They had been expecting Jesus to take his kingdom and they would be royal. They'd have a life of ease. And then here he is telling them that he's going to leave them and that their lives are going to be hard and difficult. They're having a hard time grasping that. And we see in our passage that it's causing sorrow to fill their hearts. And verse 5, I thought was funny. It indicates they were literally stunned beyond words. They weren't even asking appropriate questions. They're just kind of silent. And Jesus says, you're not even asking me about what I'm telling you. And then he says, they're grieving. They're just grieving. They can't even speak. And so Jesus continues to soothe them. And he tells them that the Holy Spirit would come and do three things. He would convict the world... So he has a ministry to unbelievers in verse 8. He will guide believers to all truth. So he has a relationship with believers in verse 13. And then his main uh, encompassing ministry is to glorify Jesus. We see that in verse 14. He only ever glorifies Jesus. He does not glorify himself. And so if you're all wrapped up in the Holy Spirit, and all was talking about the Holy Spirit, I had... One uh, person I encountered when uh, she was talk giving her testimony said, well, I was saved before I was born because the Holy Spirit entered me and I leapt in my mother's womb. And I said, well, but did you ever <laughs> come to believe in the work of Jesus for your salvation? And she just had this blank stare. She didn't even know that that was part of it. The Holy Spirit, in truth, glorifies Jesus, not himself. That's an important thing. But I want to bump back and look at how he convicts the world. At the end of chapter 15, he told the disciples that the Holy Spirit would testify and they would also. And so here then in chapter 16, Jesus is assuring them that they are just to testify, just to be his witnesses. They are not responsible for doing the Holy Spirit's job of convicting and saving people. My son and his family live on a military base, and if you've ever had experience with that, uh, you might know that the roads leading into a military base are almost always lined with strip clubs and gentlemen's clubs. I put this kind way of putting it in my slide. And
And so my daughter-in-law has to drive past that to do most anything. And so she was praying about that, and she said this, while my prayers were well-intentioned, they were laden with self-righteousness and disgust and condemnation for the people in those clubs. My heart held no compassion, only plenty of judgment. And what I've learned is that my prayers can and should be radically different. Instead of praying that they would feel shame and quit performing, I pray that the women would encounter the love and pursuit of God in a real way. And I pray for myself that my heart would always be soft, compassionate, and gracious towards them, not out of pity, but because Jesus desires that all people would come to know his love and his saving grace. That's the heart we need to have, not a heart that wants to convict. Jesus tells us clearly that trying to convict is not our job. It belongs to the Holy Spirit. And he said concerning unbelievers, the world, his job is to convict. And it tells us that he convicts in three ways, sin, righteousness, and judgment. He convicts of sin, and, and notice that it's not plural. He convicts of sin, and then he specifically says it's unbelief. It's unbelief they need convicting. Jesus clarifies that. The Holy Spirit convicts of unbelief in Jesus. Our job is not to try to bring people to some standard of ethical behavior and then have them be saved. If people don't yet believe in Jesus, they can only sin because they are operating outside of faith. Uh, Romans 14, 23, I think I put up there. Yes, what do, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. It's the Holy Spirit's job to bring people to this conviction. Now, he might use their sins to bring them to that point. But what he's convicting them of is their unbelief. And then he also convicts of righteousness. Because Jesus was the visible standard of righteousness then, but he was leaving, there needed to be another means to know righteousness. And so the Holy Spirit was sent to bring about this conviction. He convicts people that there is a standard of righteousness and they are not meeting it. That's Romans 3.23. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is a standard of righteousness and the Holy Spirit convicts people of that. And then Jesus said that the Holy Spirit convicts of judgment, that the ruler of this world has been judged. And I would send you to Colossians 2.15 where it tells us Jesus disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities, and that's Satan and his demons. He defeated them by his victory on the cross. Satan is a defeated foe, but he maintains a domain of darkness, right? And then we have the kingdom of light. People have only those two choices. You're in one domain or the other. You're either in the domain of Satan or the Lord. If you're still in Satan's domain, you're under the same judgment as your ruler. And you're choosing to remain in darkness and sin. You need to choose. He's been judged. If you stay in his kingdom, you are judged as well. Here's how Warren Wearsby tied all this together. When a lost sinner is truly under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, he will realize the folly and evil of his unbelief. He will then confess that he doesn't measure up to the righteousness of Christ. He will sense that he is under judgment because he belongs to the darkness and then he will humbly ask Jesus Christ to be his savior. So that's how that looks in process. I recently read the testimony of a woman named Emily who as a teen began living what has been called or labeled an alternative lifestyle. She believed God loved her. She'd been raised in a Christian home, but she believed that he had made her this way. And any Christians that didn't support her, she, she wrote them off. She dismissed them and called them legalistic and bigoted. And then she visited a Bible study, and the people there had this genuine, sincere love for her that she had never 
experience, totally non-judgmental. So she went home and she started reading her Bible on her own. And the Holy Spirit did this work in her. He led her to 1 Corinthians 6. And there she saw her lifestyle listed just in a list among other sins, sins like Christians suing each other and greed and coveting. And these were all labeled as unrighteous acts. And then this question popped out at her. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? She did know that. But immediately in that passage, the solution was given. Verse 11, 1 Corinthians 6, 11. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. What an important verse. The Holy Spirit convicted, not a person. The Holy Spirit, and she responded. And she asked the Lord to wash her and sanctify her and justify her, and it transformed her life. And she wrote this. People say to me, I was born this way. And I say, me too. But not one of us, this is so, so important, but not one of us is born with right affections. Not one of us. Not one of us. And that's why Jesus had to come. You feeling those desires just proves that you need grace just like me. God is calling the lost to be saved, the unrighteous to holiness. The world has warped sexuality, but God's word is clear. He can save, he does save, and he will save, and I am proof. That's her testimony. Friends, only the Holy Spirit can bring the conviction that leads to true repentance and salvation in a transformed life. Only the Holy Spirit. That's his job not ours, in relationship to unbelievers. In chapter 16, Jesus is telling the disciples that they can leave that work of conviction to the Holy Spirit, but that the Holy Spirit will involve them in his ministry. For believers today, just as was true for the disciples in this passage, the Holy Spirit still guides us into all truth. As we study the Word of God, the Holy Spirit reminds us of what we've studied, He brings understanding, and He prompts us to apply it and live it out. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in believers. And as we invite Him to fill us, He transforms us, and our lives almost automatically testify of Jesus and bring Him glory. So friends, even in our trials, we can choose to take heart we can find courage because the Holy Spirit promises to allay our fears through the Word. The Holy Spirit is the major spiritual resource that the Lord has promised to those who believe. And then Jesus talks to the disciples about a resource that will turn their sorrow to joy. So let's look at that in verses 16 through 24. And one thing that has kept striking me as I've studied these last few chapters is that Jesus is right on the threshold of his own horrific suffering. The Romans designed crucifixion to be the most torturous thing they could do to a person. That's what they designed it or why they chose to use it. So Jesus is facing the most excruciating pain and hurt that people can inflict on someone. And he spends his last few hours comforting the fears of the disciples. And the words he spoke to them, he made sure were written down for us. That should mean something to us. That is how loving God is to us. Jesus wanted his disciples and us to know how to get through our trials and sorrows. 
and it's right here in these chapters. Now, you might have noticed that verse 16 includes this little phrase. It's repeated over and over, so I hope you did notice it. This, a little while, and it might depend on your version, but these words, a little while. And Jesus was doing something very specific with those words. When my youngest son was in high school, he was on the wrestling team. And the periods in wrestling are only two minutes long. Now, you can do a lot of things in two minutes and not think much about it. But when your son is wrestling, this seems like an eternity. Two minutes. And when a wrestler is about to be pinned and he's straining to keep his shoulder up off that mat, the coach and the mother and all of the fans start yelling at the wrestler, short time, short time. And we're doing that to encourage that wrestler not to give up. They're gonna make it through. They're going to make it through. And that's what Jesus was saying to his disciples. Short time, short time. Hang on because your suffering is going to end in joy. The joy is coming. In the immediate, they would have joy because they would see him after his resurrection. And in the long term, they would have joy because they would see him when they died or when they went and went to heaven or when he came back. And in the interim, even in their persecution, verse 20 says, their sorrow would turn into joy like a woman giving birth. Like, now, many of us have been in that, that situation. And as soon as that baby comes, the suffering is totally eclipsed, right? We're holding that baby and all the suffering is not what we're thinking about. So how would this happen for the disciples? Well, they were going to realize that Jesus' suffering brought salvation. And when they were persecuted, the same would be true. Their suffering would bring about the salvation of other people. People would come to know Jesus through their suffering. But Jesus makes this important link here. He's talking about sorrow turning to joy. And then he concludes that thought by saying in verse 24, ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. And that's an important link there between joy and prayer. Think back with me to chapters 14 and 15. Jesus had talked about this resource of prayer before. In chapter 14, verse 13, Jesus had linked prayer to doing his works, greater works than he had done, works that would bring millions and millions of people to believe in Jesus. And then in 15, 16, Jesus linked prayer to bearing fruit, fruit that would remain. And that fruit that remains is people who have come to believe in Jesus for salvation. In both of all of these verses, Jesus says that we can ask the Father in his name and our prayers will be answered. Now, last week I talked about Hudson Taylor, the missionary to China. And at one point in his ministry, he decided to find out if this was really true. Can I pray for things about my ministry? And God is going to answer. Well, the wife of the head doctor of their mission hospital passed away. And there were four young children left behind. And this doctor was overwhelmed with grief. And how would he care for these children? And he decided he needed to leave China and go back to Scotland. And he left. And when he left, a major source of income, monetary support for the mission in the hospital was gone. And so Hudson Taylor decided to take God at his word. And he didn't send out any letters asking for more support. One of the reasons was that it took five months for a letter to get from China back to Britain. Five months there, five months back, it wasn't going to help them in the immediate. So he took God at his word. He said, I'm just going to pray, and you've promised to answer. So they waited. And they were down to their last bag of rice, which had to, 
to feed the mission team and the patients in the hospital. And this was Hudson Taylor's response. Well, that just means that the Lord's time of helping us must be close at hand. <laughs> now that's faith, but it was close at hand. When the bag of rice was almost empty, he received a check from a friend back in Britain that covered all the lost support and offered to pay for anything else they might need. And so, of course, the mission team was rejoicing and, and talking about this, and the patients in the hospital, all Chinese, were hearing this. And they were turning to Jesus because they knew no other God who could do that. And so the Lord brought many people to himself because Hudson Taylor took God at his word. We can ask and receive. In our passage, the resource that Jesus was offering to his disciples, the resource that will turn sorrow to joy, is prayer. But the prayer is regarding something very specific, that people would come to believe in Jesus. And that's how the disciples' joy would be full. They would see multitudes of people come to Jesus for salvation. That is the joy that no one could take from them and that no one can take from us because when people come to Jesus, we'll be in heaven with them eternally. No one can take that joy. So we can choose to take heart in our sorrow because when we pray, our sorrow can be turned to joy. We pray for the Lord to use our sorrow and our trials to give birth, to bring other people to believe in Jesus Christ because there is no other greater joy. So for, for the third time, Jesus has comforted and encouraged his disciples by telling them that the Holy Spirit would come and that their prayers for people to be saved would be answered. And then at the end of our, our chapter, he reminds them of the third resource that he offers them when they face tribulation, the secret of peace. And back in verse 27 of chapter 14, Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. His peace is a gift, but a gift has to be what? Received. Jesus had spent the entire conversation in that upper room offering the disciples the assurances and the resources that they would need to go through the trials ahead of them. In verse 27 here, Jesus reassures them of the Father's love because they love and believe in Jesus. But the disciples have this false security. They think they finally grasp what Jesus was telling them. They think they've arrived in their faith. They say, yeah, oh, okay, yeah, we believe now, and we, we don't need to ask any more questions. It's almost like they're trying not to look as dumb as they feel, is how it read. This is a dangerous mindset. We, we believe we don't need to ask any more questions. Our faith is always in process. We never arrive. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, let him who thinks he stands Take heed, lest he fall. And for the disciples, the fall was coming. And Jesus gets almost sarcastic. He says, you think you believe? You have no idea. In the next 24 hours, the world is going to throw its ugliest and cruelest tactics at me, and you are going to run. You are going to abandon me and scatter and deny me to save yourselves. But Jesus knew that he was not alone that the Father was with him, and he was going to be victorious over death, Satan, and the world. He was going to overcome. So he could concern himself with their fears and their needs and not his own. And that's when he said, I've said these things to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Past tense. It is only because Jesus has overcome the world that we can have peace in our tribulation. The secret to having peace in our tribulation is to take heart, to find comfort and courage in his victory. 
And I've used Johnny as an illustration before, but Johnny is now in her late 60s, and she's been a quadriplegic since she was 17. She's battled cancer, and recently she has suffered through COVID. And I want you to hear what she says about the secret of having peace. As you know, I've been struggling with COVID, and I thank you for praying me up and out of it. Although, I don't know, maybe you can tell my lungs are telling me I'm not quite in the clear. Being a quadriplegic, it was so hard to breathe, especially at night in bed. And when I was told I had COVID, I thought, this is a death sentence. But my disability had already taught me how to carry even this cross. For when I trusted him to see me through, even if it did, yes, mean death, when I, when I gave it all up to him, I, I could feel God take gentle, firm possession of this strange affliction and, and begin to do a work in me. It was as though the Lord pressed me. Johnny, do you believe me that I will never leave you or forsake you? That I am your ever-present help in this trouble? that doubting me only makes things worse? Do you, do you believe my grace is sufficient, whether I take you home or uh, assign you to remain? Do you trust me? And in the dark, in bed, I cried out, yes, Lord, I believe. And then in the ensuing hours and days, I felt this wonderfully odd calmness and almost indifference to how much it might hurt or how it would end. And I felt perfectly still under the hand of God. He pulled me close into a shelter and I, I felt myself resting in the shadow of the Almighty. And it felt blessed. G.D. Watson once wrote, he said, when the suffering soul reaches a calm, sweet carelessness, when it can inwardly smile at its own suffering and not even ask to be delivered, then it works its blessed ministry. Then the cross you carry begins to weave itself into a crown. When we give our suffering over to God and sink ourselves into His will, He will make every pain work its divine purpose in our lives. I trust my words are helpful to you today. If your suffering is to you a, a, a complete mystery, I pray you'll embrace God with willful thanks, finding hope in your hardships. Oh, and, and one more thing. While in the ER receiving first-class care from a hospital that doesn't know Johnny, I looked around and I kept shaking my head, thinking of the millions of people with disabilities here in the U.S. and around the I pray. I pray you'll embrace God with willful thanks. With willful thanks. Friends, we have to choose to take heart. Johnny knows how to have peace in Jesus, doesn't she? She knows how to take heart. We need to take heart and go bravely testify of Jesus, even through our trials, in and through our trials. Jesus won the victory over the world, Satan, and death, and in him, we are more than conquerors as we are filled with the Holy Spirit, pray, and live in his peace. Let's choose to take heart. Amen? Amen.